The table was originally owned by Lord Curzon, British Viceroy of India between 1899 to 1905. The table was bought at an auction at London in the year 1947. Two years after the end of the Second World War. The auction price was a princely $550. In today's money it would be worth almost $15,000. The buyer moved it to Charlotte, North Carolina, and from thence it landed at Lillian's grandpa's home, who was a collector of antique pieces. Lillian was my friend. When I heard about the table, I was curious to see it. It had been a witness to momentous events in global history. I am a history buff, say historical I would go to a place uninvited. My natural curiosity was aroused when I heard that the table had arrived as part of a heirloom, when his surviving grandpa had died. The table had been bequeathed to Lillian's dad. On a Saturday evening, I arrived at Lillian's home to see the table. When I arrived at Lillian's home, there was one James Wilson, an antique appraiser, whom Lillian had called in to appraise the table's current worth. He had found the man in the ubiquitous internet. Lillian was driven by the monetary worth more than its historical worth. Lillian took both of us to the dining room, where the table had been placed by the movers. It was not a big table. Seemed more like a writing table, or table that you would see in the backyard of old homes. It was not small as a teapoy either. However, it was a work of art. The four legs were four elephants with their trunks raised to hold the tabletop. The carpenter had taken great pain to make the elephants look realistic. The tabletop had ivory embossed in the middle in a circle form. How he managed a perfect circle is known only to him. Jimmy estimated the table to be around $10,000. Lillian was overjoyed. He and his dad had earlier discussed handing over the table to the Salvation Army. He was shocked to know he could get 10 grand for it. He told his dad about the appraisal value and he too was pleasantly surprised. Two days later the table was stolen from Lillian's home. Local television channels reported the loss of the valuable antique piece. Lillian's dad and mom were upset. Not that the table was stolen, but because someone had intruded into their home. Lillian too was angry and felt betrayed. His parents were not young anymore, they were in their late 60s, and having a thief entering the home is a traumatic experience for people in their golden years. The police launched an investigation. They questioned me and Jimmy, and asked if we had told someone about the table. As far I could recall I had not told anyone. Jimmy also did not recall speaking to anyone. I was wondering if this was not a riddle, wrapped in a mystery, inside an enigma. What else would fit the definition? Lillian's house was not broken into, no doors broken, no locks had been tampered. To add to the mystery, nothing was stolen except the table. There were no suspects and the thief had done a very neat work. Lillian's family suspected one of their drunkard uncles, who was a kind of kleptomaniac. But he had not visited their home the last six months, and he had a perfect alibi at the date and time of the robbery. He was therefore eliminated as the suspect. The detective suspected Jimmy because he was the odd man in the scene and Lillian had picked him from the internet. No one knew anything about him, except that he claimed he was an antique appraiser. The police checked his antecedents, they did a background check. He came out clean. Three years rolled by and the case was confined under the cold case category by the police. Lillian's dad had passed away survived by his mom. Lillian had forgotten all about it. Lillian was still at Charlotte living with his mom, who was 69 by then. I had moved to Boston for a job. One fine day, to use a cliched expression, I received a text message from Lillian that they had found the table. A middle-aged woman, who had tried to sell it was arrested for trying to sell stolen property, in faraway Jacksonville, Florida. It is here the tale turns more bizarre. Jimmy Wilson, the appraiser, had moved to Jacksonville, Florida, to be closer to his aging parents. He was participating in an antique road show sponsored by a local TV channel. He was not anticipating a second date with Lord Curzon's table. The woman Jesse Taylor had brought the table to the antique show and asked Jimmy, of all people, to appraise the table. There were seven antique appraisers in the antique road show, that was being broadcast on live TV. Why would she choose Jimmy can only be described as a case of serendipitous luck for the police, to get a breakthrough about this unsolved case. Before he began the appraisal, Jimmy had made the customary inquiry, as to how she came to possess the table. Jesse informed him that she had inherited it as an heirloom from his grandfather. Jimmy knew straight away that she was bluffing and he dutifully called the Jacksonville police, who alerted their Charlotte counterparts. 
the detective handling the case in Charlotte, Timothy Burns was still around. It was not necessary for him to read a file to know the story. Jacksonville police arrested the woman for further questioning. When I landed at Lillian's house, two days later, I found him stressed. His mother was distraught. Lillian's mom still looked young for her age. She could pass off as someone in her early 50s. Lillian had asked me, his best friend, to fly over to help him in the crisis. The story now takes another surprising turn. The woman did not choose Jimmy Wilson randomly. It was a deliberate act so that he could inform the police. What the woman said was more bizarre and unbelievable. She claimed that the table was given to her as a gift by Lillian's dad, so that she could sell it and make money. But the media attraction that followed the theft made her decide against selling it. This too, she claimed, was done on the advice of Lillian's dad. It seemed like Lillian's dad had led a double life. Something his wife of 33 years was not aware of. Jesse Taylor had been his paramour, his secret love. After moving to Jacksonville, Florida, and not getting any responses to her emails and text messages, Taylor decided to put the old man in a spot. What better way to do that than go public about her possessing a stolen table? It was a tale of a woman scorned trying to take sweet revenge on a man, whom she did not know was dead the past three months. Jessie showed to the police, pictures of herself and Lillian's dad seated together, sipping tea off Lord Curzon's table. She was released as there was no theft involved. So the dead man, Lillian's dad, had known about the whereabouts of his supposedly lost table. What hurt Lillian's mom most was his consummate acting skills at that time. That of feeling traumatized because someone had invaded their home. Jesse later on claimed to a TV channel that, she did not have any intention of hurting her dead boyfriend's family. She had gone to sell the table to make some money, but seeing Jimmy Wilson there and being aware of the story from her Charlotte days, she took a spur-of-the-moment decision to choose him as the appraiser. Knowing very well he would go to the police. No one could ascertain for sure, what part of what she said was true. But a thief she was not. A liar and a woman of questionable morals maybe. I have read about the legend of the Hope Diamond, that is in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington. It is said to have originated in India, and brought bad luck to anyone who possessed it. That includes the French royalty. King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were guillotined soon after they owned it. Similar fate followed anyone who possessed it. It was said the diamond was cursed as it was stolen from an Indian temple by a French gem merchant, Jean-Baptiste Taverny. Did Lord Curzon's table belong to the cursed category? Did Lord Curzon steal it from some Maharaja, or some temple? No one knows the truth. Do you?